All right, so we have chapter eight, which is going to be on even more application of Newton's laws of motion. So you can see it's dynamics to motion in a plane. So it's kind of like covering two dimensional, you know, circular motion, you know, whenever system is moving in two dimensions and we will learning to solve problems about motion in a plane in this chapter. All right. So you can see, right, suppose the X and Y components of an acceleration are independent of each other. And in a way we have been seeing this, right? So throughout the entire, you know, the, the time that we've been kind of looking at the two dimensional motion, like a projectile and thing like that, right? We would always be, you know, we were always able to, you know, treat everything as a two separate ones, right? So X direction separate from Y direction motion, and then we could say that you know x direction there's a uniform motion for projectile in a y direction there's a non-uniform motion for the projectile and things like that so it's something that we've been doing for with kinematics we can also do that with dynamics so you can see right so for, for those type of problems right so we can uh, draw a pictorial representation some kind of motion diagram if needed and a free body diagram so those are the two types of diagram that we learn how to do and those are very important, remember. So motion diagram, uh, kind of useful tool, but free body diagram is very, very important. So in my opinion, free body diagram is the most important if you wanted to like, you know, if you want to get the correct answer for the any type of, you know, force problems. All right, so we have then uh, Newton's second law <clears throat> where we have uh, net force in X direction equals mass times horizontal acceleration net force in the y direction equals mass times vertical acceleration. So those are the things we've been already, you know, doing throughout this entire time. But again, what we're doing, we're technically completely separating, right? X from Y. That means all the horizontal forces added together, separate from all the vertical forces added together, even including, let's say, the components and things like that. If you have a two-dimensional force, then we can take the component of the force uh, in X direction in a group of horizontal forces and a Y component of the force in a group of vertical forces and always including the correct, let's say, uh, the signs and things like that. And that's where the free body diagram, you know, comes in very handy, right? Because free body diagram allows you to see, verify if the component or the forces are horizontal or vertical. All right, so then one thing we, do, we did before was that we could use those dynamic equation, right? Uh, let's say, uh, so for acceleration using those uh, net, you know, second, uh, second law equations, and then use them um, in the kinematic equations if the acceleration happened to be constant. Remember, not always acceleration is constant, but if acceleration is constant, then we were free to use these kinematic equations. All right. So those are the things that we did before as well. These are the two general, you know, uh, two dimensional, you know, equations, right? Uh, where we are separating horizontal and vertical, you know, completely separate. This is general two dimensional motion. This is just in X direction. This is separately in a, in a Y direction, okay? And let's say if you have an object, if you're doing Y versus X, then for example, moving like this, then you can, you know, keep track of its motion in, along the horizontal and vertical. That means you're doing that in the, you know, independently from one another, or you can kind of combine them together and look at two-dimensional motion. All right, so if you remember for this you know, project that I kind of keep mentioning, uh, we had a very specific, let's say, um, condition that acceleration only due to gravity, the force, only force acting you know, on the object during the entire motion is gravity and would ignore all those type of, you know, air resistance and things like that. So we would say that gravity, now that we know the gravity is a force and its magnitude is mg and it's acting in a negative j hat direction. So we can just write it like this, where I can say, all right, so this is technically Newton's second law. It's mass times acceleration, vertical acceleration. And this, just, this, this vertical acceleration just happened to be uh, equals negative g. In this case, I will just, you know, get rid of that, right? A y equals negative g. So that's why we, this becomes negative mg j hat. Where in the horizontal direction, there was no acceleration if you're considering a projectile problem. 
All right, so we also talked about that if you have, you know, let's say object with some kind of lunge angle, then you can also look at in terms of what's the optimal angle. If you are launching an object uh, where you are ignoring a resistance, then the optimal object, the optimal angle, you know, proved to be 45 degrees, All right? So you can look at even this diagram over here. So 15 and 75 are actually exactly the same distance, same range. Um, 30 and 60 gives you also same range because again, those are complementary angles. So they actually give you same range. But the one that gives you the furthest range is the 45 degrees. So in the absence of air resistance, the 45 degree is the maximum or optimal angle, okay, for the projectile. All right, so for low mass projectiles on earth, the effects of air resistance or drag are too large to ignore. So that means you, you know, now that we know about all the forces, you know about, you know, let's say how they affect the object's motion, we can also now start including that. So when drag is included, the max angle for maximum range of a projectile depends both on its size and mass. Because when we simplify it and ignore the resistance, we in a way simplify the motion. We said that there is no spin, there is no, you know, let's say it's size or shape wasn't important. And that obviously greatly simplified our problem. In this particular context though, we, you know, if we include all of those things and kind of try to look at more real, you know, real life situation, then obviously size and shape important. And air resistance, even though it's small, is technically cannot be ignored. So if you then look at in terms of which one actually gives you the correct, you know, optimal angle, it's, you know, it ends up being, you know, instead of 45, it's about 35 degrees. Okay, for example, for a baseball. Um, and you can see, right, the flight of a golf ball is even more complex because the, of the dimples and effects of spin. All right. So professional golfers achieve their maximum range at the lunge angle of barely 15 degrees. So you can see, right, so there, you know, if you include more and more, you know, let's say uh, the parameters, right, into your, you know, uh, into your system, then, you know, it becomes more complex. All right, so this is uh, in terms of real life projectile uh, equation. And what we can see here is in the X direction, there is actually an acceleration uh, because we are only, uh, if we only include gravity, then gravity only acting in a X direction. So you can ignore horizontal acceleration and say it's zero. But obviously air resistance is acting at the, you know, it's such that it has both horizontal and vertical components. All right, so you can see, right, if the object is kind of moving like this, and let's say if there's a gravity mg, right, in this direction, well, air resistance acting opposite to the motion of the object, so it's acting like this. So it has a horizontal and vertical component. So this is, let's say, the drag force. So that's why there is a negative x, com x component for, you know, and there is a negative y component in a way for the acceleration, because, you know, what we get here is those two forces, drag and gravity, right, acting kind of like opposing, you know, the motion of the object. And one of the things we have here, I showed you the equation for the drag force uh, in the previous chapters. So when you talk about drag force, right, there's a coefficient of the drag, there's an area, there's a density, there's a mass, there's a velocity, right? All of those things that are important. And you have to take into account all of those things. Again, no need to memorize this equation, thing like that, right? If you ever, you know, given something, this is, will be like one of those, you know, formula that will be given to you directly so you can use that. But you can see that in this particular case, right? The accelerations are much more complex and it's not just, it's not just negative G, right? In the Y direction. And this is, this is the effect of gravity. This is effect of the drag force. And in the X direction, you have the drag force, but no gravity because gravity is not acting in the X direction. All right, so let's look at an, an example that kind of covers this uh, sort of two-dimensional motion. You have a 500 gram model rocket is on a cart that is rolling to the right at the speed of three meter per second. Right. The rocket engine, when it is fired, exerts an eight Newton thrust on the rocket. 
Your goal is to have the rocket pass through a small horizontal hoop that is 20 meter above the launch point. At what horizontal distance left to the hoop should you launch? All right, so it's kind of difficult to visualize this. So I have a nice image so I can see. So thing like this. So instead of a car, so let's take a car, it doesn't matter, right? So you have a lot the the the, um, the rocket, right? On top of the car, and then the car is moving with the speed of, uh, so let's say it's a horizontal speed, right? Initial horizontal speed of um, three meters per second. Okay. Now, one of the things we can see here is we can take that instant when the, you know, let's say a rocket will be launched uh, as our, you know, reference position. So we can say that that's our, you know, X naught, Y naught, and it's a T naught. So that means this is the time when it's, you know, uh, zero, right? So um, position zero in terms of the uh, horizontal and vertical positions at t equals zero is zero. But also we know that because the car is moving to the right with three meter per second and racket is, la you know, is, is basically uh, is on the cart, right? So when it's launched, it actually has the same, you know, initial horizontal speed or horizontal velocity as the car. So we have then this is horizontal velocity, which is, you know, three meter per second. Okay. All right, so now, but one thing we have here is the rocket, when it's launched, there is a thrust force of eight Newtons. And this force is only acting to, you know, push the rocket upward. So this is F thrust. And then obviously it has a mass, so there's also gravity. Okay. So which means the forces acting on it are, you know, let's say, again, we ignore the air resistance. So the only forces acting on it are vertical forces. So in a way we can say that uh, there's a thrust force, right? Eight Newtons. And what I have here is that there's a no, no initial velocity to start with in the Y direction, right? So initial velocity in the Y direction is zero uh, because Initially, the object was moving only in, a, in the X direction. Okay. Now, what I have here is then this. I know how high the, let's say, this is, let's say, our point one. Let's say we're going to point two. I know how high our point two is in a vertical direction. So I can say then since position one is zero, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm just using one and two. So it is zero like that. So now I can say then position two here is 20 meters. Okay, above the position one. So our goal is to, if I take this to be X1, my goal is to find X2, where X1 was zero. All right, so that's kind of, you know, one thing we're going, going to be doing. All right, so in a way, what I have here is this. I can say, okay, so this is in the X direction. This is in the Y direction. I can say X1 equals zero, V1 X equals three meters per second. Then Y1 equals zero, Y2 equals 20. V1, Y, right? The Y 1.1, right? Is equals to zero. All right. So, and then I can say that acceleration in X direction zero. So V1, X equals to V2, X equals to three meters per second. Now, I don't know anything about V2 because I know there's acceleration there. So I don't know what's the speed at that point. So one of the things I can do here is this. All right, so remember, my goal here is to find, you know, uh, what is the horizontal distance left of that? So that means I need to solve for delta x. And I have one equation, which is vx, since vx is constant, right? So vx times time. And I have vx, it's three meter per second. Right, so the only thing I don't have here is the time. That means our goal will be to try to then use everything else that we have to solve for time so that we can, you know, use this equation. All right, now let's do Let's see, what can we do to find time? Well, one of the things I can do is I can recognize that in terms of my net force in the y direction, this will be the thrust force minus then mg, which will then give you my mass times vertical acceleration. And remember, I don't, know, I don't have directly my vertical acceleration, but I can calculate that using this equation. 
Because what I have here, this is eight newtons minus then 0.5 times 9.8 equals then 0.5 times A. Is the acceleration, right? So I can then plug in because it's, you know, uh, after I divide both sides by 0.5, then I can find the acceleration, which end up being 6.2 meter per second square. So that's my acceleration. Now, what do I do with acceleration? Well, this acceleration is constant, which means since I have the displacement and I have the initial velocity in the y direction, well, which is you know zero, then I can solve for time using kinematic equation two. Where is delta y? Or you know, technically this will be y2 equals y1 plus v1y times t plus one half a y t squared. So what I end up with is then y2 is equals to zero plus zero plus one half a y t squared. Well, I have y2, I have a y now, and I can just rearrange and solve for t, which will be two times y2 over a y and then the square root. Well, if I plug in the values, I'm gonna get 2.54 seconds. Okay, what do I do with that? I take it and move it in this equation and say delta x equals now three meter per second times 2.54 seconds. And then I can calculate this finally to be 7.6 meters. That means we need to be about 7.6 meters to the left of the, you know, um, of that hoop in order to launch the rocket. So then it goes exactly through the hoop, you know, uh, 2.54 seconds later. All right, so you can see, right? It's a kind of like uh, difficult to visualize problem, but you know, um, you, you we were able to separate this into X and Y, we were able to find the acceleration and, you know, basically use similar thing like kinematics, dynamics, and all of those things to solve the problem. All right, so we have uniform circular motion. We already talked about the uniform circular motion. So we said that there is this centripetal acceleration that is equals to speed squared divided by the radius, right? But now we can also include, um, let's say the concept of dynamics into this. So it can right when describing circular motion, it is convenient to define a removing, a, a moving RTZ coordinate system. Okay. So RTZ means that, you know, we're talking about R axis, which is radial points from the particle toward the center. So that's, you know, the radial becomes very important. The T axis tangential is a tangent to the circle pointing in the counterclockwise direction. So it's not time, right? It's tangential axis. And then the Z axis, which is perpendicular to the plane. Okay, so perpendicular to, to the plane, out of the plane or into the plane. So like, let's say axis. Because then one of the things we can do is when we're looking at circular motion, so imagine particles undergoing circular motion. Remember we talked about, you know, let's say there's gonna be a radial acceleration or, you know, so radial and centripetal accelerations, you know, basically same thing. Um, the only difference here is this. So radial, I will take from the, from the center, right? I will draw an axis like that. And technically that's my radial axis. So then centripetal axis always in a way as a vector equals negative A times C because it's always pointing in the opposite direction, right? In the opposite direction, but their magnitudes are always the same. So in a way you can say that the radial and centripetal have the same magnitude and they're equals speed square over R or omega square times R. Because if V square over R, if I replace V with the omega R square over R, this becomes omega square times R. All right, so Imagine then I have, you know, the velocity for all of those three, you know, axis, right? And acceleration. My, uh, my particle will always be moving such that its velocity, you know, is never in a radial direction. It's not moving always toward the center, but it's moving such that its direction is always perpendicular to the radial acceleration. So basically the, not the direction, but the, the velocity direction, where, that's what I mean. So it has a, always a tangential velocity to that circle. And it never has a velocity where it's basically going, um, 
in a z direction, right? Basically perpendicular to the plane. It's always moving in this plane, always moving tangent to that, you know, to that circle. And that, that means we can ignore the tangential acceleration. Why are we ignoring tangential acceleration? Because it's a uniform circular motion. If the tangential acceleration is not zero, then this is basically equals alpha times r, which means that there is a speeding up or, you know, that means that it's going around in a circle. It also starts speeding faster or slower. But let's say if it's uniform, then alpha is zero, then a t is zero. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we can also say az is zero. That means there is no motion, no acceleration perpendicular to the plane. All right. Because using that, we can then solve some, you know, really interesting problems. Like for example, a car going around in a circle. So we can look at two types of, you know, uh, let's say uh, a road that the, the car can go around. One can be, let's say a flat road. Uh, the other one can be banked road. So flat also sometimes known as an unbanked road. So you can see, right, an object in uniform circular motion is not traveling at the constant velocity in a straight line. So consequently, the particle must have a net force acting on it. And net force is always some kind of force acting toward the center. So we can call that then this force as a centripetal or radial force, okay? So centripetal or radial force. And, you know, this towards the center, right? This force equals mass times acceleration. But since this acceleration is a centripetal acceleration, then it becomes mass times speed squared divided by R. And since the acceleration in this direction and force always has to be the same direction as acceleration, that means it's also pointing toward the center, right? So, for example, without, you know, if you don't have that centripetal force, then you're moving in a straight line. If you have that centripetal force, and centripetal force makes you, you know, turn in a direction, right? And the, the direction of the force will tell you in which direction is the center. So, you know, like, let's say if your particle moving like this, well, if your force is like that, that means that's the center. So it's going to moving like that. If the force is like this, then this is the center. So it will go like that. So that means direction of the centripetal force tells you in which direction your circle is or in which direction your object will be, uh, let's say, turning, right? Then what we have here, if, you, if you're talking about a car going around in a circle, without the centripetal force, it will not be able to make a turn, right? So that, that means we're gonna be seeing like, let's say two, uh, two cases, two, two types of centripetal forces, right? That can actually allow the car to go around in a circle, but the force is different depending if the road or highway is flat or it's banked, okay? So we're gonna see that you get two couple of kind of interesting scenarios. All right, so you can see here, um, kind of repeating what we a little bit talked about, but you know, now pointing from the, uh, that there's a, like a force because of the acceleration, right? So you can see that again, same thing, no radial acceleration, no acceleration out of the plane, only the tangent, sorry, velocity, right? Only tangential velocity. And acceleration, no tangential acceleration, no acceleration out of the page or into the page, right? Or the plane, only the centripetal or radial acceleration. And those are the way to find those radial accelerations. Okay. That means imagine if there's a car going like this around, you know, going around that, uh, that circular motion, right? Going around that curve or something like that. So there has to be some kind of force on the car pointing toward the center. So that means the car going like this, and there's a force pointing toward the center. So let's say if this is the road, right? It's going on the road and there's a centripetal force. Now, what we're gonna see here, depending if the, the road is flat or banked, you technically get two different type of forces actually acting like a centripetal. So we will see this in a little bit. Let's first look at this example. You have a 200 gram, a gram block and a 50 centimeter long string swings in a circle on a horizontal frictionless table at 75 RPM. Remember, RPM is revolution per minute. So revolution per minute. Okay. And then we're given the, the length of the string and then the mass of the of the block. So imagine, let's say, I don't know, so let's say this is a table. Here's the block. 
And let's say here's a black, here's a string, and it makes it go around like this on a horizontal table like that. All right. So um, then what I have here is basically this. So there, there are forces acting on it, right? So let's say there's a normal force. And in a way, I can say then this, right? So normal force is basically uh, is a, is a, is acting in, in a Z direction, right? It's acting in a Z direction, which is out of the page, out of the plane. And there's a gravitational force, which is also acting in a Z direction. Okay. Now, what I have here is there is a, um, a tension, right? Because there's a string and this tension now is now a radial force. So it's acting in a radial direction, okay? That means what I can do here is I can say that the this force doesn't, you know, give me any type of, you know, contribution to the circular motion. This force doesn't give me any type of contribution to the circular motion. Why? Because they're not pointing toward the center. They don't even have a component toward the center because only, you know, force in a radial direction gives me contribution to the radial acceleration or a centripetal acceleration. Okay. That means I need to be able to, let's say, find that. So, okay, so it says, what is the speed of the black? Okay. So now, how do I find the speed of the black? Well, I have two equations. I have then acceleration equals speed square over the radius. And I have the radius, R is 0.5 meters and mass is, you know, 0.2 kilograms. So I can use this equation one to solve for the accelerate uh, for the speed, right? But I can't because I don't have the acceleration. Uh, well, I have this equation where net force equals mass times acceleration. And this net force happened to be the tension, but I have no information about tension as well. So I have that equation with two unknowns. Now let's see what I can do. There's another equation where speed is equals to distance traveled over time. And I know that when it goes around one time, right? So we can talk about in terms of how it goes around one time. And that's basically the 25 RPM is basically it's angular velocity, right? So that means it's also, I have another equation for the speed, which is, you know, omega times R, right? So let's say here, I don't have the, you know, sorry. Let's say if I, if I did the, for example, two pi R, which is the circumference over the period, I could also use this equation to solve for the, for the, uh, for the speed. But I, I can't use this too, because I don't have the period. But now there's another equation, which says that, you know, tangential velocity is equals to omega times r, angular velocity times the radius. This now I can because I am given omega. I am given omega. This is my omega. That means I can say, all right, so the tangential speed is equals to omega, which is 75 revolution per minute. But I need to convert this into uh, meters per second which means that I have to do two things. First, I need to convert revolution into radians, where we know that one revolution is two pi radians. And I also need to convert that minutes into the seconds. So one minute is 60 seconds and then times R and R has to be then in meters. So then my, you know, let's say here revolution cancels revolution Radian is not a real unit, so it's canceled. Minutes canceled minutes. So I have then meters per second, which is units for the speed. Then I get 3.93 meters per second as my answer. All right, so that means the speed using the you know third equation, finally we were able to find. The next is what is the tension in the string? Well, now it's easy because I can use equation one to solve for the acceleration, right? And then I can then use this, you know, into the net force equation in a radial direction, which is tension equals mass times speed square over R, which is then, you know, 0.5 kilograms times 3.93 meters per second square divided by, uh, sorry guys, it's 0.2 kilograms. So then 0.5 meters. All right, so then we do 6.2 Newtons for the tension. Right, so we will, we will calculate that. 
All right, so let's look at the example that I was mentioning in terms of the car. So let's say we have a 1500 kilogram car takes a 15 meter long unbanked curve at 15 meter per second. What is the size of the friction force on the car? All right, so let's see what we have. So I have an image here that you can see in terms of the car going around in a circle. Now there, you know, there is a question. So it's asking for the friction force. What is that friction force he's talking about? Well, we know that there's a friction force, right? Generally that uh, acting on the object, you know, to prevent it, you know, it, it's moving. So, um, and that's basically some kind of kinetic friction, right? There's a, some kind of kinetic friction, but then we're not talking about that friction. We're talking about actually different friction, which exists on the car in the direction toward the center, which is in this direction. And that force is actually static friction. So what makes the car actually to be able to turn is a static friction that acting on the car pointing toward the center, All right? Remember also one of the things we have here is the car is, you know, the tires are rolling. So technically there's a rolling friction, right? But, you know, we ignore all that. We, what we wanna concentrate on a force that is acting on the car toward the center, All right? So now if I'm looking at the car from the back, thing like this, if I take this and, you know, turn 90 degrees, right? So, so if I'm looking at the car from the, from the back, I see that the car is on the surface. So there's a normal force and there's a gravity. So in, in, the, in the Y direction, So I have like, let's say, uh, or radial, right? And Z direction. So you can say, right. So what I have here is um, uh, if you want, you can say a Z or R direction, but same, you know, for us, you know, it doesn't really matter in this case. All right, so let's, let's do that. So let's be consistent. This is Z and R. So for example, I have um, normal force. I have uh, a gravitational force and I have the, the, the static friction. So this is acting in a positive Z direction, negative Z direction. This is not acting in a Z direction. They're, they're not radial, but static friction is radial. Positive because it's pointing toward the center. There is no acceleration over there, but there is M times centripetal acceleration or radial acceleration for the, uh, for the radial direction for the static friction. Then what I get here is this. Equation one will give me N minus MG equals zero. That means N is equals to MG. Equation two then give me then static friction is equals to then M times radial acceleration, which then I can write like this. That means, so what I have here is uh, basically this. Uh, my first equation is static friction equals mass times then speed square over R. Then my other equation is normal force equals M times G. Now, what I do here is this. Remember, our goal here is to say, what is the size of the friction force? Well, that means if I have the speed and if I have the mass and if I have the radius, then you know I have this equation to solve for that, okay? So it's simple enough so I can say, all right, so 1500 times 15 square divided by 50 meters all right, so, and we get 6.8 kilonewtons. There you go, 6.8 kilonewtons. Now, we can also ask you some, you know, for example, I can also, also ask you, instead of the static force, right? I can ask you what is the coefficient of static friction, for example. Well, in that case, one of the things you can do here is remembering that static friction is basically equals coefficient of static friction times normal force. So then you can do this, you know, and since, you know, if I give you the mass, you can calculate the normal force and using that mv score over r, you can calculate the, the, you know, the static friction, then you can do this to calculate the coefficient of static friction, for example. All right. Now, the real highway curves are banked. Now, what do we mean by, sometimes, by the way, this, this type of road is also known as unbanked. But the real, you know, uh, highway curves are banked be, by being tilted up at the outside edge of the curve. Okay, so you can say, right, so, so something like this. So it's, it's banked a little bit like that. And the radial component of the normal force 
then can actually provide the centripetal acceleration. Because if the road is banked, what we have here is the friction then can more or less be sort of like, let's say eliminated. Because generally what, what we do with the banked roads is that we create those banked roads because if your road is banked, then you don't have to rely so much on friction or even sometimes not rely on friction at all in, a, in order to make turn. Because remember, friction changes, you know, if the road is like, let's say, if the road conditions are different. For example, if it's wet or if it's icy, then, you know, the friction, you know, can be completely gone if it's icy, right? And then if you, there's no friction, then you can't make a turn. Well, you can eliminate that by making your road a little bit banked. So then when you're making a turn, what makes you turn, what allows you to turn and work, you know, acts as a centripetal or radial force is the normal force. And the normal force doesn't depend on, uh, you know, uh, road conditions. That means even if the road is covered with ice, you can make the turn if you are moving at what we call designated speed, all right? So, and one of the things we can see here is uh, basically the designated speed you can calculate, which I, sh I will show you in a little bit in, in a, you know, let's say, uh, in, in a free body diagram and thing like that, but thing like this. So you have, this is the you know, center of the circle. This is how, how you sort of like looking at the car from above and looking at the, the rear view, right? Where you have then the car. And by the way, this is the only time when you're not looking at the knobby that's sliding down or going up an incline. So this car goes like this, right? That means it's not sliding down or up. So. In this particular case, what I do is this. I take my coordinate system like this because I need a radial axis, right? And I have a Z axis. Okay. So now, if I'm doing that, then here's the car, right? The particle at the center of my coordinate system. And my coordinate system is basically, so you can see, right? This is the road. So my coordinate system goes like this. The normal force now like that at an angle with incline angle theta being here. Gravity now acting straight down. So this is this angle theta. Gravity acting, you know, straight down. Then what I have here is this: my net force in the radial direction is actually normal force, or actually not the normal force, but the component of the normal force. So an x or s, no, not sorry, not an r. And this is equals to m times radial acceleration. My net force in the z direction is then n z minus m g equals zero. Then what I have here is this. That means NZ is equals to, and NZ is nothing but, you know, the, the Y component, right? Or Z component of the normal force, which is, you know, basically let's say this is equation one, this is equation two. So equation one, equation one ends up being this. So the radial and R, right? Radial is the opposite to that angle. So it becomes N sine of theta. Then this is equals to M, speed square over R. Equation two then simplifies, you know, this is N and Z, right? So which is the adjacent to that angle, right? Becomes N cosine theta equals then MG, right? If you move this to the other side. And I have equation one and two. Now the best way then to go around would be to divide equation one by equation two. So divide it like that. And if I do that, the normal force cancels out the magnitude, mass cancels out, and we get sine over cosine, we get tangent of theta. And on the right side is speed square over R over G becomes speed square over RG. So then if I rearrange this, I end up with that equation. So move RG to the left, then V equals square root of RG tangent theta. And that's what you have. So this is the designated speed that you need to do I, that means you have to keep that speed if you're going around in a banked road because that speed is coupled with that angle theta, is proportional to the theta. Greater the theta should be greater the designated speed. But here's the thing. If you are moving at that speed, the designated speed that you can use, sort of like let's say to calculate, then you have no friction at all. That means you're not relying to, on, you know, on friction. And even if the road is ice, you can make a turn, no problem. 
because you're moving at the speed at which the only radial force is a normal force and normal force doesn't care about the condition of the road. It changes, for example, if your speed is higher than the designated speed. That means if you're going higher than the designated speed, then your car will start going upward. Then you introduce a static friction downward, try to prevent you from going up the hill. Now there's a friction. If you go lower, slower than the designated speed, then the car starts, you know, tending to go toward the center, down, toward the bottom of the incline. And then there's now, you know, static friction in the opposite direction. So it prevents you from sliding down the hill. Again, you introduce a friction. And this problem where you do introduce a friction becomes re really complicated to solve, really complicated to solve. So you don't want that. That's why you want to prevent this by just moving at the designated speed. Also important thing here is that for both of those examples, when you're making a turn, you, you, you hopefully you notice that mass cancels out, which means that it doesn't really matter what mass is the object have, because you can have a small bicycle or a, or a, or a, or a bike or a truck or, you know, very, you know, like let's say, or a big truck, right? It doesn't matter. The car that is making a turn, you know, basically only has to rely on the static friction or the normal force and in the independent of its mass. So that's why when you're making a turn on a banked or unbanked road, you don't see that there are several, you know, uh, let's say a designated speed, right? So you might see like oh, 30 miles an hour for this turn, but you know, it doesn't say 30 miles per hour for a truck or a car or thing like that, because mass is unimportant. Any vehicle can make that turn as long as they have the same, you know, designated, they, they keep the designated speed. But I should warn you because the designated speed that is given on the road generally assumes that it's a dry conditions. When the conditions are wet, you know, and it's a flat road, remember flat road, it's friction. And when, the, when, it's, and when it's wet, coefficient of static friction actually decreases, which means the friction decreases, which means that designated speed is too high for you. So you, should, you better slow down a little bit in order to make that turn. Otherwise, if the conditions are wet, if you're moving at a designated speed that is given over there, you, you have a high chance of, you know, basically sliding off the road if you're moving too fast. So try not to do that. Try to take that into account now that you've taken my class and you know about that, right? So try to take that into account that if, you, if, if it's raining or if it's icy condition, try to go a little bit slower than, you know, the des designated speed that is provided on the highways or freeways. All right, so let's look at then a banked road example. So you have a, a highway curve of radius 500 meter is designed for traffic moving at the speed of 90 kilometer per hour. What is the correct banking angle of the road? Again, we wanna prevent any type of friction. And what we can do here is assuming that the radius is, you know, uh, uh, five, 500 meters, the designated speed is 90 kilometer per hour. So we can make the road such, you know, the angle, right? The bank angle such that you can move at that speed. And even if it's like completely covered with ice. All right, so here's then my free body diagram, right? So you can see that you have a normal force that is at an angle. So the surface is like this. Well, never mind. Surface is like that, right? So the normal force is uh, basically perpendicular to that. So then what you have here is the component of the normal force is an acting. So this is NZ, this is NR, as I mentioned, right? So then what you have here is, you know, NR is equals to mass times radial acceleration and NZ, right? Uh, which is the Z component of the normal force is uh, equals to then MG. Again, we rearrange this when, you know, we say that M and NR is then N sine of theta and nz here is n cosine of theta. And then let's call this equation one, let's call this equation two. And then we basically divide equation one by equation two. In this case, n cancels out, m cancels out. And what you have sine over cosine becomes tangent of theta equals then ar. ar is the radial acceleration, which we can write as speed square over, you know, rg. All right, so in a way we came to the same equation, right? Then from here, I just solve for theta by taking inverse tangent of speed square over R, RG. 
and then inverse tangent of, um, first let's find the speed, right? If, if I take the speed from 90 kilometer per hour, if I convert this, which you can should be able to do, becomes 20, uh, 25 meters per second. So it becomes 25 meter per second squared, then divided by 500 times 9.8. This is inside the argument of the inverse tangent. Calculate the tangent to be then 7.3 degrees. That means if you keep the angle or make the angle of the, of the road 7.3 degrees, then you can move about 25 meters per second, which is roughly, remember, double that to get the miles per hour. So roughly 50 to 60 miles per hour. No, MPH miles per hour. And um, you can then basically go around highway, you know, speed, right? Without using the, uh, the, the static friction. All right. Now we can expand our knowledge of the circular motion into like, let's say motion um, much higher above the Earth's surface. Because one thing we know here is this, right? So we learn about uh, projectile, right? we learn about projectile. And uh, what we learned here is that if you throw the object with some horizontal velocity, so here, like right here's the Earth, right? You throw something, it's gonna go and come back, hit the ground like a projectile. You increase the velocity, it's gonna go a little bit further until it hits the ground. Even more, it's gonna go even further until it hits the ground. So then higher you go, even more is gonna go up. So, down. so, And one of the things we can do here is this. So if you go some height above the planet Earth, right? So the surface and this H here is significantly larger than few meters that we've been considering the entire time. See, if you throw with some velocity, it goes projectile, hits the ground. If you throw harder or, you know, shoot harder, right? With the higher initial velocity, it will go further until it hits the ground. If you do it even harder, right? Then it will go even further and hits the ground. But then you can throw with such speed, right? Where it's moving and it's still, for, it, it, then it, it wants to fall. But when it wants to fall, then earth is also curving under it. So every time it wants to fall on the ground, Earth is you know curving under it. So then it kind of keeps curving and curving, and curving, but it never falls and it kind of goes around what we call orbit. All right. So that means the projectile falls all the way around the planet because the curvature of the trajectory matches the planet's curvature. That means its curvature is matched by the planet's curvature. And what we end up here is basically it's going down, but because it's never falls on the ground because earth, earth is curving under it. So then you can call this, this trajectory D, right? We can call it orbit. Now that's basically how the, uh, the satellites and things like that basically work. Uh, those communication satellites and things like that, you move it up or, you know, you basically use a racket, right? You go above the atmosphere a little bit and then you shoot it horizontally. And it basically goes in a you know, free fall, two dimensional free fall. But because it's high enough, it goes through this trajectory D rather than A, B, or C. So that's why you have to have some, you know, specific height, specific, you know, horizontal speed, and then you can achieve this, you know, orbital motion. All right, so let's talk about this approximation. And it's, again, this is just an approximation that we use as a flat earth. So right now you have to be a little bit careful when you're using this approximation, right? So. This is just an approximation which we use as a flat earth, or it is not flat, obviously, but this approximation assumes that your height above the surface is just very small compared to the radius of earth, okay? That means you're very close to the surface. And in that case, the trajectory, you know, always gonna come back because of the gravity. That means any object's trajectory gonna be, you know, all the way, you know, hitting the ground. So now, but because let's say the actual planets are spherical, the real force of gravity is toward the center of the planet rather than toward the you know, surface. And let's say here it's down here. Well, it's not down anymore. It's toward the center, which is now a different direction. That means you have to take that, that into account. Uh, and in a way you have to say that the, now the direction of the gravity is always not vertically downward, but toward the center, okay? 
And you have to understand that, you know, the, the height that we have right now, this H, is comparable to maybe the radius of Earth, where here the, the, this R is much, much smaller than the radius of Earth. Let's say here, like, let's say if I'm talking about height, right, it's much, much smaller than radius of Earth. In that case, then we can look at in terms of some kind of, you know, object undergoing a circular motion, right? Circular orbit, circular motion. So obviously then what I have here is acceleration equals the net force over the mass divided by the mass, which it's still a free fall. So that acceleration is G toward the center. And what I have here is then, what I have here is the acceleration, which is still equals to G, but it's also the radial acceleration so it's also equals to speed square over r. But this is speed of the orbit, right? So you can see, and that is equals to g. That means you can rearrange and say speed is equals to then, you know, square root of r times g. And that's the thing. The only thing that, you know, the speed of the satellite depends on is how far up the surf, you know, the above the surface it is. That's why if you go 1000 kilometers, then you have to have a very specific orbital speed in order to maintain that orbit. You go 2,000 kilometers, then you have to have a very specific, which is proportional to the, to the e is proportional to the square of r, right? So that means you know you have to understand, right? That means if you go twice the distance, or let's say four times the distance, then you get to get like let's say twice the speed and thing like that. So in a way, your speed of the orbital speed, right, depends on only the distance, right? So required speed of a circular orbit you know, planet surface, neglecting air resistance. That's also important that we are neglecting air resistance. And we can, because when you're really, you know, uh, high enough compared to the surface of Earth, air molecule density is very low over there. So in a way that's a very, very low resistance. So we can pretty much completely ignore that. All right, so we also have the period of a low orbit, which is the speed, you know, remember the equation, right? Speed equals distance over time. But if distance is the you know circumference, then it becomes just a two pi r, and this becomes a period, and this is just rearranged equation of that. Now period is two pi r over the speed, and since orbital speed is you know square root of r g, then you can just basically rearrange this and end up with this equation. Period equals two pi square root of r over g. Okay. Now here's the radius of Earth, which is roughly 6,400 kilometer. And let's say if R is approximately the radius of the Earth, then uh, the T here is about nine, 90 minutes. All right, so P is about 90 minutes. An orbiting spacecraft is constantly in free fall. Same thing with the International Space Station. It's constantly in free fall. That's why you see all of astronauts being weightless, right? Because their acceleration when they're going down is matches the gravitational acceleration and that's basically free fall, they're, they're weightless. All right, so let's look at an example here. Uh, so the communication satellites are placed in a circular orbit where they stay directly over a fixed point on the equator as the earth rotates. Because let's say if you're a uh, Los Angeles you know, radio company or let's say TV company, right? You send, you know, send the satellite so then you can have a bigger broadcasting, you know, range. Well, you don't want, let's say the earth is move when earth is, you know, spinning, your satellites, you know, lags behind or something like that. You want the satellite to move such that it's always above the Los Angeles, right? So the, this type of, you know, orbits are called geosynchronous orbits, okay? Where the, the satellite is, you know, kind of like fixed, you know, uh, above your, uh, you know, your location, so like, let's say. All right, so the altitude of a geosynchronous orbit is 3.58 times 10 to the seven meters, which is roughly 22,000 miles. Now, what is the period of a satellite in geosynchronous orbit for this particular, you know, communication satellite? And we're gonna find the value of G at this altitude. And we wanna say is that, you know, because you remember you, you are, you are 22,000 miles above the earth's surface. Is G the same as on, on surface, which is 9.8, or is slightly different? You know? interesting to kind of find out. And what is the weight of 2000 kilogram satellite in a geosynchronous orbit? All right, so let's do this then. So we are, you know, we have like a, let's say table of the known and find you know, information, right? So 
we're given the, the R, which is 3.58 times 10 to the seven meters. But also remember, we're talking about the, you know, the R to be with respect to the center of earth. That means we have to say that R is equals to H plus radius of earth, where H is the, you know, 3.58 times 10 to the seven meters. And the radius of earth is 6.37 times 10 to the six meters. So then R will basically will be the sum of them. All right, so it is then 4.22 times 10 to the seven meters. Okay, now to find the period, right? To find the period, uh, let's say we can do a calculation, right? We can do a calculation, but it should be very obvious, right? I mean, how long does it take for the Los Angeles, for example, to go around, you know, basically spin, right, one time. Well, it takes 24 hours, right? And if it's geosynchronous and it's kind of like stuck, right, fixed right above the Los Angeles, then it also should take 24 hours to go around. So that's kind of, you know, what we have. That's why geosynchronous means that it, it spins, right, with Earth and Earth makes a complete revolution in 24 hours. Well, so does any geosynchronous, you know, uh, satellite. All right, so part A is 24 hours, okay. Now, part B, it says find the value of G at this altitude. All right, so we can do that uh, because we know that G is equals to that our radial acceleration, right? And one of the things I have here is this radial acceleration is equals to R times, you know, omega square. That's one equation that we have. Uh, we can also do from other things, but this is easier because of one particular reason. Uh, because if I'm talking about omega, remember omega is basically two pi over the period, right? Omega is two pi over the period. And we square that, so then I can calculate G as R being 4.22 times 10 to the seven meters. Then I have then two pi divided by, you know, 24 hours. So that's, you know, that's, that's why it's very easy to find, you know, um, the, you know, the angular velocity, which, you know, in a way we could have also used to solve for the, you know, linear velocity, right? Which would have been, you know, two pi r over then uh, the, the period, but, you know, you just make it a little bit more complicated, right? It just actually a little bit easier to use omega always. But we need to convert this into, you know, uh, meters, right? Let's say, uh, because, you know, acceleration is meter per second square. So we have to convert this to into seconds. So one hour is 3,600 seconds. Then we square this. Okay. All right. So let's see what I get for G. Well, it's 0 0.223 meters per second square. You can see it's very small. It's very small. That means, you know, the Earth's gravity effect, right? is barely there for the satellite, okay? So where on, on the surface is 9.8. So then uh, what is it? It's roughly 42 million meters from the surface is about, you know, a quarter of, you know, uh, like 0.223 meter per second square. All right, so last one. What is the weight of a 2000 kilogram satellite in a geosynchronous orbit? Well, one thing we talked about, remember, so the satellite is in a free fall. And if you're in a free fall, you're weightless. And if you're weightless, then if you're talking about your weight in terms of if you're standing on a bathroom scale or some kind of, right, something like that, then basically it's gonna be zero, right? So you're gonna be weightless because it's in free fall. So your weight, if you're just looking about, talking about, you know, that, yeah, so it's gonna be, you know, a zero. All right. So there are also some, what we call fictitious forces. So if you're riding a car in a car that makes a sudden stop, you seem to be hurled forward. You can describe your experience in terms of fictitious forces. And, you know, after this has something to do with, remember that, you know, inertial mass. So the fictitious forces are not real because no agent is exerting them, okay? It's just the tendency of your body, right? To keep moving forward, or if you're at rest, to basically, you know, stay at rest. So that's why when you, uh, you know, press the accelerator in your car, 
the car is moving forward, but your body kind of seems like it wants to stay behind. So that's why, you know, you have that, you know, let's say you have to be pulled forward, right? When you are, uh, let's, or, you know, when you kind of push forward when you are speeding up or when you're slowing down, hitting the brake, basically other way around, your car wants to stop, your car stops, but your body wants to pre move forward. So that's why you kind of like, let's say hold forward like that. All right, so fictitious forces describe you, your motion relative to a non-inertial reference frame because your reference frame, the car, right, is not, in, not inertial at that time, which means that it's accelerating. Only the constant motion frame is uh, inertial frame. So this figure shows a bird's eye view of you riding in a car and it makes a left turn. All right, so you probably have seen, you know, you know, experience this, right? So when you make a turn, your body seems to kind of moving to the, you know, in an angle like that, right? So like, let's say like in that velocity over there. So from the perspective of an inertial reference frame, the normal force from the door points inward, keeping you on the road with the car. So the relative to the non-inertial reference frame of the car, you feel pushed toward the outside of the car, right? So that's why you are, you just basically, you're sitting on your seat and then the car, the car is turning and then you, it seems like something pushing you toward the, um, toward the door, right? Okay, so again, this is a fictitious for, uh, force, right? And this fictitious force basically seems to push an object to the outside of the circle is called centrifugal force. There really is no such force in an inertial reference frame, okay? So that's why we call them fictitious forces. All right. Now, one of the things we have here is, let's say you're talking about the object being, you know, weighed by a spring scale on Earth's equator. Okay. Because one of the things we also have to take into account is the fact that, you know, Earth is also spinning, right? It's also spinning. That means if you're standing, you know, on a bathroom scale, like that image, you know, shows you, right? So you have two forces acting on you technically. It's a normal force and gravity, right? But, well, as you're standing on a bathroom scale, you're also moving in a circle. That means those two forces, right? Those two radial forces technically cannot be equal to one another because you are moving in a circle, which means the forces toward the center should be stronger than the forces basically opposite of, toward the center which is the spring force, right? So that's kind of like, you know, interesting thing, right? That means, you know, if you're standing on a bathroom scale, that means technically the gravity is stronger than the spring force. So when you look at this, you know, let's say generally like if you pretend the spring scale reading is equals to your weight, right? So this has the effect of weakening gravity. Why? Because technically if you're saying that the gravity and spring force are equal to one another, that means the net force equals zero. But in reality, there is a net force toward the center of earth, which means gravity is stronger than the spring force. So technically that's what you have. And the actual equation then is this, right? So then uh, the force, uh, which is basically acting on you, right? Minus the effect from the, you know, rotation, right? Uh, divided by the mass, okay? So this is the equation of the GM time over R square, right? So this basically ends up being actually what the G of Earth, you know, represent if you're talking about the circular orbit. So, uh, and this is minus omega square times R, which is the effect, uh, what we call the, ac you know, angular acceleration, right? So basically we have a linear acceleration minus, you know, sort of like, let's say due to the angular acceleration. So remember this, radial acceleration, right? Sorry, tangential acceleration was equals to, you know, oh, sorry, it's actually radial acceleration. It's equals to then uh, R times, you know, omega square, right? So we kind of talk about that. So this is that what it is. So that means what you have here is there's a, you know, acceleration. So your G, right? So basically acceleration G earth minus that the radial acceleration because of the fact that you are kind of going around in a circle, okay? So this should be then the correct G, which should be in a way a little bit, you know, um, let's say G earth is stronger than what the G would be if you are measuring from the bathroom scale. Actual G will be actually a little bit stronger. 
All right, so in a way, the, um, the last thing that we have in this chapter, basically talking about non-uniform circular motion. That means when we're going around in a circle, the speed at different times is different. So let's say if you have a, a roller coaster like this, the speed at the bottom is larger than the speed at the top. So we call this loop to loop. So you're going around, right, in a loop like that. So, uh, and you have two points of interest. So let's say here's point one and here's point two. Point one is at the bottom, point two at the top. And then you can see that even from the diagram, right, those speeds are not equal to one another because one of the things we're gonna be seeing here is the you need much higher speed in order to basically overcome gravity and be able to go and reach point two, all right? Because one of the things we're gonna be able to see is like, let's say where you at the bottom, when you're at the bottom, how the force is acting on you compared to when you're at the top, okay? And again, this is a non-uniform circular motion because of the different speed. That means the speed is not uniform, right? Speed is not constant. Now, because it's going around in a circle, there has to be a net force pointing toward the center, right? That's what allows you to go around in a circle. Let's look at that point one, which is at the bottom. When you're at the bottom, there are two forces acting on you. So imagine this is a car and you're sitting there, right? There are two forces, normal force from the seat upward and then the gravity downward. But since center is here, there has to be net force toward the center, which means taking that, you know, this radial axis like that, whatever is toward the center is positive, whatever is away from the center is negative. So then what you have here is normal force minus mg, that's your net force. It equals to mass times radial acceleration, which is equals to, since radial acceleration is speed squared over r, we say that it's mass times speed at the bottom square over the radius. Which means that if you rearrange, then the normal force, you move this to the other side, your normal force becomes mg plus mv at the bottom square over r. That means normal force at the bottom is larger than mg. Why? Because, well, if the net force is up, up force should be larger than the bottom force. So that means normal force is, you know, greater than gravity. All right. How about if you're at the, at the top, point two? Well, over there, basically here's your curvature, right? Here's the center, here's the radial. Well, now you are upside down, remember, you're upside down. So normal force and gravity both pointing down. So that, that, that means your net radial forces is just sum of m plus mg, which is equals to mass times speed top over square, a square divided by r. Now, if I move this guy to the, to the other side, then I have n equals, you know, the mv square over r minus mg. And in this case, the normal force at the top you know, can exceed mg if v top is large enough. Now, here's then what we have. So you can see, right, you're doing the difference. For example, let's say your mg is 100 newtons, for example. Then what you have is this. This term, right, this term, hopefully, right, hopefully is not too large, right? It's not too large. Because one of the things we have here, it always not, let's say, too, uh, too small, for example. Because let's say if, if I rearrange this, right? If I rearrange this, there is nothing wrong if, let's say, normal force is, you know, larger than mg, which means, like, let's say, if v top, let, let's say, the speed at which you have, right? If, if you're going fast, right? That's fine. The dangerous part when the speed starts, you know, decreasing. Because one of the things we can do here is this. So at the top of a roller coaster, the normal force of the track is given as, you know, this equation here, which is derived there, right? So as V top decreases, there comes a point when normal force reaches zero. Why? Because then if this is 100 Newtons, then if this guy decreases, 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 eventually it will become also 100 Newtons. Remember, initially it was let's say maybe 120. So then difference gives you 20 Newton for the normal force. But let's say this can become lower if the speed decreases. How low? Well, it can go 100 Newtons. If this, you know, this term becomes 100 Newtons, then weight is 100 Newtons, normal force becomes zero. 
Well, this is dangerous enough, but still you can actually be able to make successful turn as you know, as unintu you know, counterintuitive as it is. That means at the top, you kind of off your seat, right? Because it's moving slow enough that you kind of off your seat, but it has enough speed to bring you down successfully, right? If I do that, then I need to so find, let's say we can do that and find what is then sort of like, let's say this designated speed. Because if I have mv square over r minus mg equals zero, because normal force equals zero, that means those two are equal to one another. Canceling the mass, we can see then v is equals to square root of r times g. So we call this critical speed because this is the lowest speed you can have in order to make you know, successful, you make it back successfully, okay? So this is the slowest speed at which the car can complete a, the circle without falling off the track. What happens if you have lower speed? Well, not a good, you know, not a good day, let's say. So think like this, the normal force adds to gravity and makes large enough force for a car to turn the circle. So if the speed is greater than critical speed, then no problem, it goes and comes back. Speed is equal to the critical speed. Now you, you reach the limit. Normal force equals zero at that, 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 that instant, but still, you know, it has enough speed to go and come back successfully. That means it has enough time to reach this point two. You know, that means that the, the, the critical distance is basically able to reach this point two. But if the speed is less than critical speed, sometimes, you know, this point two is known as a turning point. That means if the V is equals to VC, it can still reach this, you know, turning point, which is the highest, highest altitude. If the V is less than VC, then it reaches the turning point somewhere where it's not exactly point two, then it starts going down from there. But since that critical, you know, the, the turning point is not point two, well, it's, it goes after the rails then. All right, so that means gravitational force is too large for the car to stay in the circle and the normal force becomes zero somewhere over here. Then you go basically after, after you know, after rails. Anyway, so let's look at an, an example here. You have a 500 gram ball moves in a vertical circle of 102 centimeter long string. If the speed at the top is four meter per second, then the speed at the bottom will be 7.5 meter per second. For part A, what is the gravitational force acting on the ball? All right. So for part A, I don't need anything, you know, fancy. Gravitational force is just mg. So it's 0.5 kilograms times 9.8. So it gets 4.9 newtons. You know, easy enough. Part B then says, what is the tension in the string when the ball is at the top? That means imagine, so here's your object at the end of the string and we are at the top. Like this. All right, so when we're at the top, there are two forces acting on it, tension and mg. All right. So then if I'm looking at the, my net radial forces, so this will be tension plus mg equals an m v square over r. Then I can solve tension here as mv square over r minus mg. All right, so I can calculate this, right? Since, you know, uh, I know the mass, 0.5. I know the speed at the top. So this is top, which is four meter per second square divided by the radius, which is 1.02 meters. And then minus mg, which I just calculated as 4.9 newtons. So we can calculate and get 2.9 Newtons. That means this is the tension. When is it at the top? Okay. Because tension changes when it's at the bottom. So when it's at the bottom. So here's my object. Well, now the tension acting up, but then gravity mg acting down. Remember there has to be still net force upward, which is again, same thing, right? Net force downwards was over here. So then for part C, what I need to do here is I say, all right, so then tension minus mg equals mv square over r. This is then 
at the bottom. Okay. Then tension is equals to then mg plus mv score over r. So 4.9 newtons plus then 0.5 times 7.5 meter per second square divided by 1.02 meters. Calculate the tension, we get 32 newtons. You can see right by how much it increases. It, it goes from basically roughly three to 32, 10 times bigger in order to make the, you know, the object go around in a circle because it's, it's, it's going against gravity the entire time it's going up. But when it's coming back down, the entire time it's going with the gravity, right? So that's why, you know, it has to have a much higher speed at the bottom so it can actually reach the, the top on its way down, it doesn't have to be go fast, going fast because gravity is going to make it go faster. It's going to make it speed up as it's going down. All right. Okay, so for the non-uniform circular motion, then you can see, right, where the tangential acceleration now comes into play. Because before we said that, you know, there's no tangential acceleration, but now there is because we're going to be speeding up as we're going down. Remember, this was the equation for the tangential speed, which is dv dt. And also, we derive this in the equation in, in the you know for the rotational system where tangential acceleration also equals to r times alpha, where alpha is the angular acceleration, and tangential acceleration is related to angular acceleration because if there's angular acceleration, means that the object is basically you know, uh, increasing its angular velocity. Well, if it's increasing its angular velocity, that means it's also increasing its tangential velocity. Since tangential velocity equals r times omega, right? If, if this is increasing because of the alpha, that means tangential velocity also increases, which means you have a dv dt. Not just a direction, but also acceleration, uh, the, the, you know, magnitude. Then what you have, you have two acceleration, right? The radial, which is v square over r, or omega squared times r, and then tangential, which is dv dt, or r times alpha, okay? So radial changes your direction, tangential changes your speed. So that's why now you have a non-uniform uh, circular motion, okay? Then in terms of the angular quantities, the equation of constant acceleration, kinematics, right? So that means, you know, in a way this is um, you can still use, right? Uh, that means you can still use because the it's a non-uniform circular motion, but acceleration is still constant. And then you can use your rotational kinematic equations, right? Uh, remembering that angular velocity is the d theta dt, and then angular acceleration is the omega dt. So those are how those things are related. All right. So this then represents the actual net force acting on the object when it has a non-uniform circular motion. Because what we get here is this. If the object moving like this, but then starts speeding up faster and faster and faster, that means you have two types of net force. There's a net radial force, which is responsible for making you go around in a circle, and net you know, tangential force, which makes you go faster as you go around in a circle. Okay, that means you get two of those, you know, so you can say, right? Net radial force equals mass times radial acceleration, and then net tangential force equals mass times tangential acceleration. Right, so that means these are basically m, m v square over r, and this is m times dv dt. So kind of like those are the equations for those two types of acceleration and two types of you know net force. That means you have this radial and tangential, and obviously you know those are the components of this total net force, which in this case will be acting you know at the, at an angle like that compared to let's say a radial line. So that means you get components. Each one does very specific thing. So that's why. When you don't have this, it's a uniform circular motion. Well, when you don't have that, then obviously going in a you know, straight line and speeding up or slowing down. You have both, then you go around in a circle and you start 
speeding out. All right. So, and these are basically in terms of that radial, which I just you know uh, draw for you. So in a way, the you know one extra thing you can do here is let's say say this is then uh, dvdt like that. Other than that, you know, pretty much that's a complete equation for the two-dimensional forces that uh, you know kind kind of like complete entire picture of the object that can go in a tangential direction, right? Uh, and also in a circular direction. That means it can go around in a circle and also uh, speed up and slow down. All right, guys, so this concludes this chapter. So um, we'll work on this tomorrow and, um, and we can then have this, um, you know, next chapter covered uh, in next time in the next video.